last name, Jeremy, <laughs> Mattinger, hard G, not soft G. Now you all know, and you can all correct everybody that says it wrong. <laughs> I, but that's not what my 7x7 seven is seven about. Um, <laughs> for those of you who have attended many CLA summits, you might be familiar with some of the topics I've presented. Uh, back in 2014, I gave a presentation in which I pointed out that you were all reinventing the wheel by rewriting the eyes of the ship of LabVIEW. Then a couple years after that, I accused you all of being brainless LabVIEW programmers. Then last year, I gave you all a guilt trip for not using the VI analyzer enough. So in keeping with my long and storied tradition of making all CLA Summit attendees uncomfortable, I present the stack sequence is dead, long live the stack sequence. <laughs> so before I get started, let's have a moment of silence for the stack sequence. All right, that's enough moment of silence. All right, so the stack sequence was born in 1986. It shifted with Live 1.0. The stack sequence died in LabVIEW 2014. That's the version in which it was removed from Quick Drop and the palettes. It was survived by its younger brother, the flat sequence, who was always a little bit jealous of, because it was kind of an overachiever. Everybody loved the flat sequence. Now, I say the stack sequence is dead. It's actually only mostly dead, because <laughs> if you drop a flat sequence, you can actually right-click on it, and there's a menu option that lets you convert it to a stack sequence. <laughs> Mostly dead. But for the purposes of this presentation, let's just call it dead. Now, why did we murder the stack sequence structure? The main reason we murdered it is because of sequence locals. Sequence locals are terrible. It's the only way, besides like a local or a global, where you can pass data from one frame to another. So you pass data to the right side and the sequence local, then in the next frame you've got this wire that has to come all the way over and it just looks so stupid. Um, another reason that we murdered it is because, I don't, I don't know what it is, it's kind of like the rotten apple making all the other apples rotten, but if you drop a stacked sequence on your black diagram, you instantly start writing terrible looking like code <laughs> that you otherwise wouldn't have written at all. <laughs> And then another reason that people always said is that the stack sequence hides code. It hide, hides code. Hide, hiding code's terrible. Well, let's talk about hiding code for just a <laughs> The event structure hides code. The case structure, which is the most common object ever dropped on a VI other than a wire, hides code. They might say, well, the flat sequence doesn't hide code. Yes, it does, because if you've got a flat sequence that spans four monitors, and you can only see this monitor's work, you're still hiding a bunch of code. So what, why, don't we, why do we say that the stack sequence hides code, but none of these other things hide code? Well, it's because the, the way code is hidden in the case structure is a little bit different, and that little difference ends up being something that makes code very easy to read and navigate, and that is, that a case structure and an event structure, you're not really flipping through cases, you're paging through named cases. So it's kind of like reading a book and seeing the chapter titles, right? So whereas the stack sequence was 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, the case structure is initialize, something, something else, update, display. Those are names. So not only can you click on the little drop down and see all the names, you can also use control scroll wheel to flip through the cases really quickly and see the names up there. And this is so being a really efficient way to navigate code, and it's the reason that we don't really complain about the case structure of hiding code. So, LabVIEW is a parallel language, and we're all really excited about that. But, there are many times, and you can't argue with me about this, there are many times, times where we have to run LabVIEW code sequentially. You have a test system, you need to run this test, you need to wait 500 nanoseconds, you need to run this next test, you need to wait 300 milliseconds. Like, you have to run sequential code sometimes. Scrolling a wide diagram of like 20 things that you need to run sequentially, that's awkward. That was that little picture I showed in the bottom where you kind of got to go over here, oh wait, here's what's happening in step 16. Oh wait, let me go back over and see what's happening in step four, that's awkward to do in the editor. Paging through sequential tasks that is intuitive. Now wait a second, isn't that what the stack sequence structure does? Doesn't the stack sequence let you page through sequential things? Should we revive the stack sequence structure? <laughs> no! No, we shouldn't because sequence locals are the worst and there's no way to fix them. So, the stack sequence structure needs to stay dead. Now, I've only used up about five minutes, I think. 
All right, I may end up needing a little more than two, but since I still have a few more minutes, I'm gonna move on to my next presentation. The stat sequence is dead. Long live the NAT sequence. Now before I tell you guys what the NAT sequence is, let me talk for a second about the sequence loop. If you Google LabVIEW sequence loop, you will be taken to a page on NAT.com which has this mini pattern where you can download. It effectively mimics the functionality of a stat sequence with a while loop in a case structure. And it basically runs through cases one, two, three, four, five, where it's the default case in itself. This is a really neat mini pattern, and I used it for a while, but I had a few problems with it. For one thing, it's a while loop. That rubs me the wrong way. I've got a certain number of things I want to run. Why am I using a while loop? I feel like I should be using a for loop. It's also not self-documenting. You've got frames of one, two, three, four, five, just like with the stack sequence. You've got to add subdiagram labels to see what's going on there. And what if you've got steps one, two, three, four, five, and you need to add something in between three and four? Well, you add a frame, now you've got one, two, three, four, four, five, and you gotta go, you know, make stuff. There's tooling to fix that, but it's extra tooling you have to run on the thing. So I solved all of these problems with the NAT sequence, and here it is. So take that in for a second, and let me talk about some of the things that you see here. That is a non-typedef enum for defining the sequence. That is the one place where you define the order of things that happen in your sequence. There's this really neat malleable VI that will take that enum and turn it into an array of enums. So if your enum had the days of the week, for example, uh, it would generate an array of seven elements, and those seven elements would be the uh, days of the week in order. Uh, that malleable VI is gonna ship with LiveV2020. And then the for loop is gonna execute those enum values in the exact order that are in the enum. And the most important part about this thing, the thing that ties it all together, is that cheeseburger right there, which actually looks like a cheeseburger, but it's really an X node that implements a compiler optimization that will, no, I'm joking. It's just a good job. It's a good job. You need to run the cheeseburger picture if you don't like it, kind of like a vegetarian or something. All right, so why is the NAT sequence so great? The case structure breaks when you add a new frame, or I'm sorry, when you add a new step to your sequence. That's a good thing. That makes you go add a, a new frame to your case structure for that particular sequence element. The order is defined entirely in enum. Uh, there's the shift enter trick where you're typing in an enum, press shift enter, very easy to add a new frame. You can do that in the case structure as well. This is self-documenting. We don't have frames of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We actually have the frame names. Uh, you can stop early if you want to, which you couldn't do with a stack sequence. You can just have to for loop have a conditional terminal. <clears throat> there's very little extra code here. There's the enum and the malleable behind, that's pretty much it. So just out in the wild, I've used the NAT sequence on a lot of things. Here's some code I wrote for the Veristan team. Does some XML generation. Pull a lot of stuff I have to do in order to generate that XML. This is a sequential diagram. Let me use a NAT sequence for it. So the enum defines the frames, and then we go in and we do the things. So you can download this today, bit.ly slash NAT sequence. Download the template and let me know what you think. Thanks, everybody.